Father, thank you this morning as we come as your church, as we are before you together as your people. We pray, Father, now as we study your word that your Holy Spirit would open, Lord, our minds to understanding, Lord. Lord, give us wisdom. Lord, thank you, God, for what your word tells us, the promises that it reveals to us, and that, Father, as we'll see, they are all yes and yes in the Son, in Jesus. We ask, God, that, Lord, you bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. You can take your Bibles this morning and turn them back to, to Galatians 3. And I remind you as well that uh, if you are new or uh, if you've been here and didn't, maybe didn't hear, there is uh, some study books in the back that you can... Uh, Take, in, uh, take notes in with the notes that I give out, and you can put them in there, but it looks like this. It's free to you. It just helps you to keep your notes uh, together, and so uh, you're welcome to step up and grab that. It's on the back table, and uh, very helpful just to keep everything in, uh, in line and in symmetry in your thought. Also, just a reminder as well uh, that uh, we'll be starting a new catechism, our next section of catechism, and it coincides with our our adventure club and so your students and you will be memorizing the same catechism as you go through and that's a card like this it's also on the back table this is a way to have devotions and time and and focus everything and and streamline everything as well as we're around uh, our uh, being shepherds of our family so I encourage you to do that and encourage one another with it uh, but this morning we open our our word up to Galatians chapter Three, where we continue on. On December 20th, many, many years ago, in fact, many years ago, 1988. Can you remember where you're at, 1988? Things were a little bit more calm, kind of. I think I was uh, um, just married in that time period. It's been a while, a long time ago. But the story is told in the Los Angeles Times reported a story of a rescued a rescue that took place, and the story goes like this. A screaming woman was trapped in a car dangling from a freeway trans, uh, uh, transition road on East Los Angeles. The 19-year-old woman apparently fell asleep behind the wheel about 12.15 a.m., and, and the car, which plunged through a guardrail, was left dangling by its left rear wheel. And uh, a half dozen a motorist stopped, grabbed some ropes from one of their vehicles and tied the ropes to the back of the woman's car and it hung until the fire uh, units arrived. A ladder, it says, was extended from below to help keep the car stabilized and the car, uh, as the firefighters tried to uh, take, uh, while well, they strapped down the vehicle to tow trucks and then uh, proceeded to try to rescue her. So every time the car would move, said the one rescuer, the woman would yell and scream. She was in pain. And it took almost two and a half hours, the story goes, to, to secure the car and pull the woman to safety. One of the rescuers said, in fact, the, the fire captain said, it was kind of funny, not, not that she was there, but this, the marshal recalled later that she kept saying, I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. As I read the story, it uh, made me think of the response of so many people who give to the question of where they're going to spend eternity. Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins that we just remembered at the Lord's table, taking upon himself the sins of each of us. But the common response is, when asked, how do you know you're going to be in heaven or will you be in heaven? We know the common response is, well, I know I will because I'm a pretty good person or I think God will accept me or I keep his, I keep his word as best I can or in other words saying, I'll do it myself. If I work hard enough at being good, God will let me into heaven for sure. The well-known Baptist preacher by some, H.A. Ironside, some of you may know him, one of the, the old dead guys, 
once said that there are really only two religions in the world, one in which it was by grace, referring to faith in Christ alone, and all others which was by works. And then you can count them, every one of them, by some way that, merit, that, God, that man merits his salvation. And this, as we know, is not some new phenomenon as we have seen in our study of Galatians. It is as old as the fall itself when sin entered into the world. And this is, the most, this is most evident here in our study of Galatians as Paul addressed those who had, had come into the churches which he had planted, who had received the gospel of grace, but then were confused by certain men who had come in preaching another gospel. And as Paul, Paul said, and the Holy Spirit said, it, it was quite clear that in fact it's not another gospel. It's not the gospel at all. These men who came in, as we know, we call them Judaizers. They are those who claim to have faith in Christ for salvation, plus, though, adding to it the law. Acts 15, 1, Paul dealt with them. As we know, as we were reminded Acts 15, 1, that he says some men came down from Judea. While they were at Antioch, Paul and Barnabas, teaching this, unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. You cannot be saved. And as we learned in chapter 3 of this letter, Paul, with skillful leading of the Holy Spirit, confronts the Judaizers and the Galatians and reveals the, the foolishness of their understanding. Remember, he said, foolish, you foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? And he showed them the fallacy and gave some facts concerning the law. Remember, as we look here, just review the fallacy of justification through the law. He gives three of them. Abraham was, he says, Abraham was justified by faith alone. Even so, it says, Abraham believed God and, did, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Secondly, true sons of Abraham are justified by faith, he says, alone. Galatians 3, 7, therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. Scripture is always, thirdly, Scripture is always taught that justification is by grace alone, through faith alone. Verses 8 through 9, the Scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. Paul continued on revealing not only the fallacy of justification as we learn through the law, but he showed the facts concerning them, two of them. Those, he says, who trust in the law are cursed. Those who trust in Christ are blessed. It's pretty simple. He makes clear those who think they're going to follow the law, for as many are of the works of the law are under the curse, of, for it is written, as we just read earlier, spoke of earlier in the communion service. Curses everyone who does, who does not abide by the things written in the book of the law to perform them. If you are going to do the works of the law, you must keep how many of them? Every one of them. Perfectly. Only perfect people go to heaven. Look around. Think, look in, inwardly. Is anyone perfect? Are you perfect? James says, just one sin, just one sin condemns us. And he goes on, he says, now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. That's been the teaching all along, quoting from the Old Testament, Genesis. However, the law is not of faith, is it? On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Now you'll notice it feels like Paul is just being redundant in Galatians, but but you know what? We need redundancy. Those who are trusted in Christ, he says, are blessed. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Again, coming, having become a curse for us. For his written curse is everyone who hangs on a tree in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. It is this that the Apostle Paul goes on to expand upon concerning 
the law. And what we'll be looking at this morning, this promise that God gave to Abraham was the promise that he speaks of now in verses 15 and following. For he says, in you, again, he quotes from Genesis 12, 3 earlier here, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so continuing now this morning, then in verses 15 all the way through 22, Paul goes on to affirm again this promise of blessing through Abraham. In doing so, it seems that he, he anticipates a response from the Judaizers. Well, one, we see, we see the response of the question, of why then the law, verse 19? And the, and, and the question here seems to be, could it be that with Abraham, the promise was given to him, but God, with the addition of the law through Moses, added to the promise, keeping of the law, which fits exactly with the Judaizers. You are saved by faith, but you must be circumcised and practice the law. Faith plus works for justification. Anticipating this, Paul shows both the significance here and the distinction of these two covenants, revealing that one does not and cannot replace the other, and further, that the covenant of promise to Abraham is preeminent, it is superior in relation to the purpose of the law mediated through Moses that came later. One is superior, one is preeminent, the other is inferior in a sense in relation to it. And this is what we're going to look at this morning. Now, as we look at these two covenants, I don't want to assume that everyone here is familiar with these two covenants. We've been talking about the Mosaic Covenant in part, of the law, concerning the law. But it's important that we understand these because particularly the Abrahamic covenant is a, has a large eschatological uh, footprint as it lays out the redemption plan of God for his elect. And so I want to look at this for a moment, just to uh, explain these two in brief so that we can understand what Paul's talking about in specifically. So turn over with me to Genesis chapter 12, and we'll be in there uh, often here this morning, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And just so you know, this is part one, so don't, don't get overwhelmed uh, by the clock. Just focus, because it takes a little bit of focus. Here in Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3, was the promise God gave to Abraham, in which he said and made clear that blessing would come. So we read here, we see here that Abraham says, or God says to Abraham, now the Lord said to Abraham, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be bl a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And here we see God gives this promise, plural promises, three to be exact, as we know, for those who, who have uh, been here for quite a while should understand this, that there are three of them. They are land, they are seed, and they are blessing. And you've seen this before, this nice uh, picture. There, I make it a little bit easier and point them out to you. But there are specifics here. Land, he says, I, land meaning that the land which I will show you. And this is important as we'll see in God's, uh, God's timeline and his purposes. And even with Israel, even now, it's important to understand. This is not something new. Israel is in the land, and there is, there is a challenge over it. They're not in the, all the land, not from the uh, Euphrates to the, to the river Euphrates to the, to the river in e of Egypt. But God is working. God is, we, we live in biblical times. 
and I will make you a great nation, he says. This speaks of seed. We'll see later here. And the one who curses you, I'll curse. And this is verse 3. And you, in you, he says, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so there is a blessing. Now, what, does the, what do these mean to us? Well, the Lord just doesn't say this and stop here. He continues on, and we see throughout Scripture God's plan. In fact, we see from Scripture these promises are perpetuated or extended in three other covenants to show the, the expanse of these promises uh, eschatologically on the things to come. And so you should be familiar with another chart that we've given out in the past, that these are extended in three other covenants the Deuteronomic or slash Palestinian covenant. We call it Deuteronomic because of the, there tends to be a confusion over Palestinian, right? Remember, just again, if you haven't been here in the past, uh, Palestinian does not mean uh, the Arab nations. In fact, in, it was given as a negative to Israel uh, by the emperor Hadrian, the Roman emperor in AD 135 because he got tired of their revolts and so he renamed the city, and he renamed the, the country, Israel, and called it Palestine after Philist, Philistia. Hence the confusion because the Gaza Strip would be in the area of ancient Philistia, the Philistines, right? Just waiting, are you with me? You know what the Gaza Strip is? If you don't, you're, uh, you've, you haven't been around or had your eyes open lately. And so it is that there's this confusion that's being used and it's being popularized. But this is a promise given. It's perpetuated in the Deuteronomic or Palestinian, Deuteronomy chapter 3, 1 to 10. The seed is perpetuated in the Davidic covenant. Again, promised to David, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 13, 16, and all the verses there, and I think I, I'm not sure if I shared all of them in the extra notes. Um, you feel free to take a snapshot or you can ask me and I can make a print of this. Thirdly, we see a blessing in the new covenant. We just talked about the new covenant. This is the, this is the blood, right? This cup is the blood of my new covenant, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, we're not going to talk about the new covenant this week. We'll talk about it next week because we just don't have time. Unless you want to stay, I'll be glad to. Now, we see these three, but they're significant to what Paul says. And so you need to understand these. These are all three here important to what Paul says. This is the Abrahamic covenant, a promise. What about the Mosaic covenant? Well, let me just say in brief, I don't have any chart for you. The Mosaic covenant of law came after, as we'll see. In fact, it came 645 years after the covenant with Abraham, the Mosaic covenant came at what? Mount what? It's Mount Sinai. God told them, and when they came to Mount Sinai, God gave them two things, you remember? The what? The law and plans to the tabernacle. See, that's why we have redundancy. The plans of the tabernacle. And the law God gave, God gave the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, the moral law. He also gave, you read your Old Testament in Exodus chapter 20 and following, all the way through Leviticus. But you see in the Exodus 20 and following, you see also what's called the sundry laws. Like, hmm, sundry. When I was a kid, I used to go to the sundry and get a malt. Is that the same? No, that's not the same thing. Sundry means various, and it means various laws. It's speaking of the various laws, the judicial laws, the, the, where, where uh, the law was given and how they related to each other, practiced jurisprudence. In fact, we have many of our laws based on the sundry laws in our nation. Thirdly, we also have in the law, ceremonial law. Ceremonial law was the law in which God used and showed and brought about a way to atone for sins. We'll talk about that more next week. But this was the law. These were the two law, two covenants that Paul is, is speaking of. 
And so we come back to our text here. We see that these two covenants, the Jews proper, that is the Jews, not Paul, not the Judaizers, were holding on to the law as a means in which they believed they could be justified before God. And here in the context of Galatia, the Jews that came to Galatia believed that Christ was the promise of the Abrahamic covenant. They believed that, but they also again added the law in addition, plus the law, faith plus the law, Christ plus circumcision. Uh, without these together, no one could be saved. Again, Acts 15, 1. And so again, we come back to our text, and Paul anticipates this, that the Jews believed that with addition to the law that came later, God added the law to the promise. And Paul says, no. It's evident that he did not. It can't. It couldn't. So anticipating this, Paul shows both the significance and distinction again of these two covenants, revealing again that one cannot change the other. And further, that the covenant of promise given to Abraham is superior to the covenant of law, which he will show that it is also inferior. Not, not inferior in its substance, but inferior in what it brings. And so we'll look at these two and so this is the context. This is the laying out where we're at. Let's look at the text now, beginning here, part 1a, the superiority of the covenant or the preeminence of the covenant of promise, we might say. In these verses, he shows four ways in which the covenant of promise is superior. It is superior in its in its permanence, as we'll see, it's, it's superior in its promise and its, in its precedence, also in its very principle, it's superior. And so let's begin here looking quickly with the time that we have. First, it's, it's permanence. Notice he begins showing the permanence of the covenant and the promise given to Abraham. And he does show, so by beginning with really showing, the, starting from the lesser to the greater here, speaking of just a basic human covenant, just on the basis of a, of a human will, Right? If you were, if you had a will and you died, is it, can it be changed? No. No. And here he says, brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, just on a normal basic covenant, though it is only a, a man's covenant in human terms, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. If you Make an agreement with somebody. Let's say you make a business agreement with somebody and you decide to back out of it. What's going to happen to you? Oh, it's okay. I'll, I'll take the loss. Is that what happens? No. Lawyers get involved, don't they? Even today, obviously, when you make that contract, it is binding. It is binding. If it's broken, lawyers get involved. Now, obviously... You can change a contract, but then it's a what? A new contract. It's a new contract. But we're going to find out something different with this, this superiority of this covenant, the preeminence of this covenant and its permanence. Paul's argument here is, from again, from the lesser to the greater. His point is, even if human covenants are, if even human covenants are irrevocable and cannot be supplemented, when, when made, how much more a covenant given by God? In other words, the covenant with Abraham cannot be revoked by a later covenant, nor can it, an additional stipulation be added to it. The covenant with Abraham stands as it was given originally. God's covenant with Abraham was not, an, was only, was not only unchangeable, permanent, but unlike the covenant given through the law of Moses, God's covenant with Abraham is permanent. It is an unconditional covenant. What do I mean by that? I mean it's unconditional. That's what I mean by that, all right? It's unconditional. It means that, that it was not dependent on the receiver of the covenant, but the giver. In this, sake, this case, God only. You're in Genesis, again, Genesis 12 to 12, verse 1 through 3. I want you to notice here. Notice and read this and, I, and see if you can identify the, the, 
the unconditional nature of this covenant promise to Abraham. We see here, it says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make you your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And I will curse, uh, and who curses you, I curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. What is the unconditional terms here? It's I will, I will, I will. What's missing from here? Conditional statements. Now, wait a minute, there's a conditional statement that says go, right? You need to go. What if he doesn't go? Well, there is in that sense that condition. But, it's, but when Abraham goes, remember that Abraham went and the scriptures tell us that Abraham what? Believed and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He believed by faith. It was reckoned to him as righteousness. Not only do we see this unconditional, uh, the unconditionality of this in its words, when God ratified the covenant, we read in Genesis chapter 15 that God did it himself. He didn't have Abraham apart from him. He didn't shake a hand. He didn't, he didn't uh, make it in the sense where Abraham had a part in it. You remember what happened, right? Genesis chapter 15, verses 19 through 21. Abraham slept. God said, Abraham, go out, take the offerings, Cut them in half, split them in half, and then he put a deep sleep on Abraham. Affirming his covenant, remember he was concerned about the covenant of God's fulfillment. God, God ratified it here by blood. And remember that in chapter 15, then he put Abraham asleep, and then God, with a pillar of fire, went through the sacrifice, making the covenant dependent only on who? On God, on Him. Only on Him. And so it is that, that God ratified this covenant after He prepared it. Abraham did not take, make any promises. God made the promise. I will be the promise. So Paul shows us first it is, is permanent. It's a permanent covenant. It's superior because it is not made between God and man, in a sense, with conditions. But it's made between God and man based on God alone, promised by God alone to man, to Abraham and those who would become his seed. And he says, all the families of the earth will be blessed. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And this is exactly what Paul now shows and affirms now in verse 16 as we move on, showing secondly the superiority of the promise itself is superior. It's superior in this, in its promise. In the promise itself, it's superior by its very nature. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and seeds, as referring to many, but rather one, and to your seed, that is, Christ. Notice Paul here uses the plural promises. What promises is he talking about? How many are there? There are three in the covenant. What are they? Land, seed, and blessing. This is a test, all right? We don't just, you know, we, we engage here, all right? So, he says, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He says that these promises were not just spoken to him, but to his seed. What does he mean by this? Well, he explains it. That seed is Christ. Not referring to many, but rather one. And to your seed, that is Christ. Paul is referring or quoting from uh, Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, where God reaffirms the covenant to Abraham after he takes Isaac up uh, to uh, be obedient to Christ. He affirms it again. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, seed obviously can be mean seed, when I say seed, it can be plural or singular, can it? And Paul says this is seed, singular. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through the seed, your seed. Speaking of one who is Christ. 
because you've obeyed my voice. So here he shows here, again, the seed is Christ. What's significant? What is the significance of this? Well, first of all, the promise was fulfilled in Christ. The, the, the promise is founded in Christ. It's centered in Christ. Showing that these promises, these redemptive promises given to Abraham were, were those which, which have been founded not on Abraham but on Christ. Where do we see this? Well, Paul reveals that this goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15. What did God promise in Genesis 3.15? <laughs> well, judgment for sure, but also redemption, right? Genesis 1 and 2 is creation. Chapter 3 is what? Fall. It's the fall. And God says here in, in, in the text that he tells us that he will put enmity between, between the, the man and the woman, right? Genesis 3.15, he says this. But I will put enmity between you and the woman, that is, the devil, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Speaking here of the seed, referring to the woman who has no seed, refers to Christ, already speaking of redemption. It goes clear back to Adam and Eve. This promise originated with Adam and Eve. It is perpetuated through Abraham. As Dwight J. Pentecost says this, immediately after the fall of man, God revealed his purpose to provide salvation for sinners. This program was gradually unfolded by God to man. This promise made to Abraham represents a progressive step in revelation. And so the seed of the woman is, again, as Christ revealed that he would come through the seed then of Abraham, that seed. In fact, he says, we see in Scripture, this seed, which is Christ, would be, be the descendant of Abraham. It would come through Isaac. It would come through Jacob. It would come through the tribe of who? Judah. To, through what king? David. David was the promise. Does that sound familiar? Remember we talked about this. This is another covenant extended to who? David called the what? Class, it's called what? Davidic covenant. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 13. This progression is not only confirmed through the line of David in, in, the, in the, uh, the books of history of the Old Testament, but is affirmed over and over again by the prophets. That's why we celebrate Christmas. You might be familiar with one of them, maybe Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 or 7. I don't know, it feels like Christmas is already here already. Where did summer go? This is, a, this is a precursor for Christmas. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, right? And the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. That sounds familiar. There's others, Isaiah 7, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 53, Jeremiah 23, and Ezekiel, those are all listed in the notes, Daniel 7. Hosea, Amos, Zechariah, all of them speak of them. In fact, when we get the New Testament, what do we see in the New Testament when we get there? We open up Matthew, verse 1, what do we see? This is what we see. The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of who? Abraham. Mary, when she visited her cousin, she came and and uh, afterwards, she sung a song, a psalm of praise to the Lord. And we read, in light of it, she gave glory to the Lord. And uh, through the Holy Spirit, it says, she said, God spoke as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. This is the promise fulfilled. God was, Christ was the promised seed and, and Christ uh, and, and all the promises were given to Abraham are fulfilled in Christ and to Christ. He is the king over all. He will reign over all. He will reign. And, and this is significant, specifically, in a sense, all of God's promises, every one of those promises of land, seed, and blessing are unconditional. It means that they will happen. That means, why is Israel in the land? Because God said they would. Why? Because of his promise. Well, how will it be fulfilled? When will it be fulfilled? Well, God tells us when it will be fulfilled. He shows us in Scripture. In Revelation, he speaks of it. In fact, every one of these 
speak of being fulfilled ultimately in the, in, in the millennial kingdom. Let me give you another chart. You've probably seen this chart before. Notice the lines. And notice the church experiences a new covenant, but it was made with Israel. We get to experience, but God will ultimately fulfill it with his promise because God is, God is faithful. God is faithful. And this is what we see. This is what God, Paul says. Now, I'll come back to this or make reference, but it's, just, but it's mindful of us, of where we're at now and the future we hold. God will come. Christ will come. He's already come. We're in a church age. The tribulation will come. Christ will come and take his church from understanding of Scripture and will bring tribulation. And that tribulation, tribulation is for Israel. He will redeem for his people. He would redeem them. They will look upon him to read in, in the prophets. And they will repent. They will have remorse. Whom they hung on the tree. Whom they pierced. This then leads us then to the third promise. Or the point of superiority that is in its precedence. Now Paul says, what, it, what am I saying? In case you didn't get it, this is, this is it. What I am saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate the covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. So he's saying, you get the picture? You get the point? I already made this clear. Once the covenant is ratified, could not be changed or added to this being true, then it makes the point that the law, having been ratified by God himself, could not be invalidated or nullified by the, by the, uh, the law the covenant of law that came 430 years later. I say, like, wait a minute, you said 645 earlier. Are you confused, Pastor? No. Sometimes, yes, but not today. 645 years was the time that, that the covenant of Abraham was given. But what Paul is mentioning here is speaking of the last time the promise was given. We see in Scripture that the promise was, was repeated to Isaac in Genesis 2, 26, 24, and then to Jacob in Genesis 28, 15, and again in Genesis 46, 2 to 4, right before uh, uh, Jacob slash Israel goes into Egypt. 400 years. It was at this point of time that Paul calculates 875 B.C. to 445 B.C. is 430 years. For the last time it was spoken, Paul says, and not to forget Paul's point here, he's saying, knowing even on basic terms a covenant cannot be changed after it's been ratified, its terms must be met or the covenant is broken. And this covenant of promise could not be broken because of what? Why can it be broken? Because it is what? Right, it is a promise. It's unconditional. He cannot break it. Does God break his promises? No. No. So Paul says, by its very nature, it is superior to the law which is as we will see, is a conditional covenant. It is a temporary covenant. But it is purposeful. This brings us then, fourthly, to its superiority based on its very principle of the covenant of a promise. He says, for if the inheritance is based on a law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise, he says. Here Paul affirms the obvious. If the inheritance, which refers to the promise of God as a covenant with Abraham, which was land, seed, and blessing, is unconditional promise, here specifically focusing on the promise of the seed, which is Christ, narrowing it down to the focus on the, uh, on the inheritance, which is not simply the land or the promise of the new covenant or blessing, but specifically the center of it, which is the seed, which is Christ, the inheritance of justification as a salvation. Paul says, if then this inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on the principle of promise. As we have seen this, it is not possible by nature of the covenant but also according to the principle of its, what it means, what a promise means. What does a promise mean? It means a 
especially from God, that it will come to pass. And so what Paul is making clear here that this promise is just not just a promise made by anyone, but it's a promise that he says is actually by grace. It's by grace. Paul says it was granted to Abraham by means of promise. By means of promise. This word granted, charizma, you might see the word charis in there, which is the word for word what? Grace, right? Charisma, charisma uh, means to show someone a favor, to be kind to, to give or to bestow a thing willingly or by grace. Give something by grace. Graciously give. God graciously gave this covenant. So the promise of inheritance does not depend on observing the Mosaic law or being circumcised or any other law or any other work. Rather, the promise is a gift of God's grace and is freely bestowed in Christ Jesus. And those who belong to the family of Abraham do not enter to the family by subscribing to the Mosaic law. Right? Not all, Paul says in Romans 9, not all Israel is Israel. Why? Not ethnically, spiritually, because of Christ. Not all are sons of Abraham. Why? Because Abraham is one who was saved by faith. He believed and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, as righteousness. And the children of Abraham then are those who are united to Christ as with Abraham. Hence they receive the promise of the gift. They are the sons. Remember what, it, what Paul made clear earlier in how justification in Christ is received? Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 7. Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. As the theologian Thomas Schreiner said this, he says, Here we see the sweetness of the gospel from which we derive great comfort. We are not right with God by our obedience, but by our faith in God's promise, we receive what he has given to us in Christ Jesus. The law says, do this. The gospel says, accept this. Which begs the, begs the question, which are you? Are you like the woman at the beginning? Said, I'll do it myself. Which God says, you are cursed. You are cursed. For many are those who works of the law are under the curse. And cursed is everyone who does not abide by these things written in the book of the law to perform them. Those who are of Abraham by faith benefit of the blessing of Abraham and the promise of Abraham to Israel will, will take place. They will come about. Now we're going to talk about them more next week but just reminding you of this, this picture again. What does this mean? It means that, that God is... God's progressive plan is in full view here to us. And many of you are looking at Israel and looking at what's going on and overwhelmed, but God says, don't, don't be fearful. I am in control. I am sovereign over all Psalm 109. God is sovereign over all. And so as we look at Galatians, we, this, is, this is the deep stuff. This is, this is crazy, Paul. Why are we learning this? Why? Because this is God's promise. And as Paul says, again, as I prayed earlier, all the promises are yes and yes in Jesus. And it begins with the promise of the seed and accepting the seed. And so again, the question is, as we prayed this morning, are you a child of God? You're a child of God. And we are so only by grace through faith plus nothing. So then what about the law? Verse 19. What then of the law? Why the law then? If this is the case, why the law? Well, we'll answer that next week. And Paul says the law is not as superior as the promise. But it is important. It is important. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for, Lord, sometimes we, we, we need to go 
continue to go deeper because, God, you are uh, the God who revealed, Lord, your truth to us. And word by word, verse by verse. I pray, Father, that as we think about these, and Lord, some of this may be new to, to, uh, to those who are here. But it's all in the process of our sanctification and understanding and knowing. But Lord, because of this, we have hope. Lord, you are working, just as you say in John 5, as you told the Pharisees, I am working and I am working till now, just like the Father is working. For we are one. And so I pray, Father, for your church today. Lord, as we go out, that God, we, we look with certainty. We look with that we understand, Lord, the gospel. We understand the promises. And we understand our future. That we are not like those who are without hope, without God in this world. But we know the God of the universe. We know the God of, of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob and David and all the patriarchs and all who have come before us and one day we'll know you face to face oh that will be the day Lord but all of this is because and by grace through faith Lord in Jesus name amen you stand as me as we close this morning and we sing together, and, and can it be, which says everything about what Abraham, or about what Paul just said, about how we have the blessing, the promise.